Hi YouTube, my name's Jeff and I'm the Vegil Guy. A while ago now, I shared a green sand lost foam casting technique with you and showed how the process can be greatly simplified using simple plaster of Paris fence and feeders. It's proved to be very popular and a lot of you guys have written to me talking about your successes. Unfortunately, I did rush through the vent and feeder making process and I have had a number of requests to cover the topic more fully. As I'm going to be doing some casting videos for you soon, I thought now was a good time to do just that. I've tried to find easier construction techniques which I'll show you now and I'll also cover how to make and use a silicon mould. Let's start with a vent. Shopping on eBay I found these candles. A box of 25 worked out at around 50 pence each which is nice and cheap and they're ideal for my purpose. This is a one and a half inch waste pipe. It's a bit old and tatty and it's been chewed by my dog but it's fine for what I need today. This is plastic cut from a used veg oil container but you could just as easily use an ordinary plastic bottle so I'll use both. The plastic bottle needs to be cut to be roughly the same length as the candle. The top of the bottle makes a useful funnel especially if you cut the screw section off as I did here using an ordinary hacksaw. This is extruded foam but ordinary white expanded foam works as well. The pipe is firmly pushed into this and it carves out a nice circular hole. This tapered end of the candle makes it easier to push the candle centrally into the foam. The plastic is wrapped tightly around the pipe and this is held in place with some rubber bands. Once slid from the pipe this sits nicely in the foam and the candle is pushed into its hole. With the funnel fitted plaster of Paris a little on the thick side is poured in. I guess there wasn't quite as much gap as I'd thought but a little agitation soon sends the plaster on its way into the plastic sleeve. Tapping the sides removes any trapped air and the candle gets centralised by eye. It can float up so do make sure it's well seated. After an hour the sleeve is twisted from the foam base and the rubber bands are removed. Then it's simply a case of unwrapping the plastic. All that remains now is to free the candle and make the actual vent but the plaster needs to dry out first so leave it a good couple of days and a nice warm temperature. When ready place it in your oven in such a way as you can catch any dripping wax. Here I've placed three on a simple foil tray angled slightly forward and funneled into an old drinks can. I'm going to keep the wax as I've already got a few uses in mind. Once the wax has stopped dripping, it's all done. After a little clean up with sandpaper, here's the result. A simple hollow plaster tube, ideal for a vent. I find it best to make several of these and keep them handy for when I'm casting. Now let's look at the feeder. Last time I went with a standard sealant tube for the internal diameter and I'm gonna do that again now but the cutaway can idea was a little tricky. This time I'll be using the thicker plastic but first let's start with the bottom of the feeder. For this shape we'll need to make a cone pattern along with a silicon mould and the mould starts with a simple box. I used MDF as I had plenty of scraps lying around and it's easy to work with. The top and bottom are 5 inches square and the sides are 5 inches less the thickness of the MDF. The height of the sides is twice the thickness of the MDF. I've also got some small scraps for the corner supports. The sides and corner supports are glued together with good waterproof glue. At the same time I glued up some more scraps to form the cone. For now it just needs to be a square about 3 inches wide and the depth of two thicknesses of MDF. I want the silicon to stay inside the mould box and in my last build the silicon came out. So this time I added a couple of small wooden sections to help grip the silicon. The top and bottom of the mould box need to be fixed with bolts so I carefully drill four corner holes. To help with future alignment a marker pen is used to add witness marks. A fifth hole is then drilled centrally and another bolt inserted. 
With the mold box completed, it's time to make the cone. The width of a drink can seems to be ideal, so this is the measurement we'll use. You can see here I've drilled a 12mm hole in the centre, and through this is a length of 12mm threaded rod. Some washers and nuts are very securely tightened either side. I'm going to be turning this to make a cylinder and then a cone, so it would be helpful to remove the corners first. This could be done with a hand saw or a chop saw, but I've got this wood carving disc that I'm enjoying experimenting with, so I'll be using an angle grinder. I haven't got a lathe, but I have got a drill press. With one end firmly clamped into the chuck, a couple of test pins show that everything seems nice and stable. So I turn on the drill and everything spins nicely. Again, I'm using the angle grinder with this wood cutting disc. But you could just as easily use an angle grinder with an abrasive disc, or a belt sander, or even a block of wood and coarse sandpaper. Initially, I just want to remove some material. The trick is to be very light with your touch and make sure you go with the rotation of the work and not against it. The more circular the wood is before you start, the easier this will be. But with just a little bit of care, it doesn't take long to form a cylinder shape. Now, you might think this looks a terrible mess, but the blade has actually done its job, removing a lot of material quickly. A block and sandpaper will clean this up nicely. Here I'm offering up a piece of rainwater pipe that's pretty close to the size of a can, but I should really be using calipers to take a more accurate measurement. A little more material needs to be removed, so the process is carefully repeated until the work is nearly there. At that point, I start to form the cone, and now the material really starts to fly. So eye protection, a face guard, and even a good mask are useful at this point. I'm Vegeman, subscribe. After a bit of sanding, it's a nice fit and it's good to go. To hollow out the inside of the cone, I used a normal step drill. This does require a firm grip, so be careful, but otherwise just take your time and let the drill bit do its work. The drill bit leaves ridges, but these can be removed with a round bar and some sandpaper. Last time I used water to stop the silicon sticking, but this caused the MDF to swell. So this time everything will be finely sanded and three coats of fast drying varnish are applied, with a fine sanding between each coat to remove all brush marks. Ron, one of my subscribers, recommended using car or furniture wax as a mould release agent. So every surface has been given several coats of car polish, except the insides where I need the silicon to stick. I wish you could feel the difference. Everything is slick, shiny and, yes, slippery. If nothing else, this layer of wax will further help seal the MDF and prevent moisture problems. I decided at this point to add a few holes to allow the silicon to escape when compressed. The last thing that's needed is a plug. Again, this was made on the drill press in a similar way to the cone. Its job is to hold the cone centrally during the mold making process. This is actually the plug I made last time and it's a little bit loose, so I've wrapped some red tape around it. A little research showed me that some mold makers apply petroleum jelly to their molds to prevent silicon sticking. So that's what I did. Every mating surface, everywhere I didn't want to stick, even on the bolts themselves, I applied some petroleum jelly. This is just ordinary silicon. It squirted around all the edges, up the sides, across most of the bottom, but avoiding where the cone will be inserted. Silicon is then added to the sides of the cone, and the cone is inserted into the box. It's twisted to help remove any air pockets, and then the nozzle is pushed deeply into the silicon and squirted a little more. The idea is to remove all voids. Once finished, a wetted finger pats down the top to squeeze everything in place and a tiny bit more silicon is added for good measure. The lid is pushed on firmly and the nuts are well greased and screwed tightly home. Some silicon will squirt out of the holes at the top and out of the sides as well so be ready for some mess. 
everything should then be placed in a warm place for 24 hours. The next day, the bolts were removed and I used a sharp blade to cut away unwanted excess. Then I carefully prized the blade between the top and bottom joints. I actually tapped the blade with a wooden stick at times, but there's very little force involved. It's just a matter of breaking the join. You could, of course, use a whole knife, and really you should, but I'm just a bit daft. The top and bottom were then twisted free, and I was very pleased with the results. But there's a lot of silicon here, so it needs to dry out some more, and another 24 hours in a warm spot was definitely needed. Now here we are 24 hours later, and everything has been cleaned up easily with a nice sharp blade. There's one little fault which you can see here, and I can fill this during the next step. It was caused by the drilled holes, so I filled in the corresponding hole above this point. I also filled the bottom centre hole, as this isn't needed anymore, and I don't want silicon coming out there. Notice that the top and bottom have been cleaned and waxed again, but the male section of the mould needs to stick to the lid of the box, so on the underside, a small circle is scraped clean of wax and varnish with coarse sandpaper. A small bolt is then inserted into the lid, and this is tightened securely and has a number of large washers added to help the silicon grip and form the male part of the mould. Once again, everything that I don't want to stick is covered with a thin layer of petroleum jelly, and this time that means everything except the small circle and the bolt. Even the silicon is coated this time, as silicon is quite happy to stick to itself. Then silicon was squirted into all the nooks and crannies of the bolt. The cone was also filled, and the little silicon was squirted into the imperfection. At this point, the lid was squeezed on and the bolts tightened once more. This time, I left it 48 hours before risking pulling anything apart. Again, it was necessary to break the join on the edges, and with this done, I found the bottom came off quite easily. I then massaged around the cone to try and break any join. With the final twist, the lid came off and it was a good result. It may initially look a little messy, but these are fine strands of silicon that were sandwiched between the jelly. A little cleanup was necessary, including cutting away the misshapen section, but overall the result was something I was very pleased with. And as you've probably guessed, I left the whole thing another 24 hours to ensure it was nice and dry. And this completes the mould. Now all we need to do is use it. The bottom of the mould box isn't really needed anymore. I make use of a piece of plastic instead. Once again, everything is covered with a thin coat of petroleum jelly. It really does seem to help. Some plaster of Paris was mixed up, again a little on the stiff side, and the central void was just slightly overfilled. And that's what you want. Experience has taught me that if you underfill, anticipating the size of the other half of the mould, there's invariably voids and imperfections. It's better to overfill and squeeze some out. I made note of the witness marks and pushed everything together. I didn't bother with the bolts this time, but simply added some weight to the lid. I left this an hour and lifted the box from the plastic. I then twisted the top, revealing a nice inner cone shape and very little excess plaster thanks to the jelly. A gentle push from underneath and out it popped, a little ragged around the edges but otherwise perfect for use. I was now ready to add the sides and form the feeder, and as stated earlier, an ordinary empty silicon tube is ideal for this, but to help alignment I decided to add a plaster of Paris cone to this first. Once it had set for an hour, I removed it, gave it 24 hours, then sanded it slightly so that it always fit perfectly back inside the cone. I also gave it several coats of PVA, as plaster on plaster tends to stick very quickly. With the cone lightly sanded to remove burrs, it's time to form the sides. And I'm going to use more plastic for this. A beer can tends to work best for this I found, and ironically my favourite brand just happens to be the desired dimensions, or at least that's what I tell the wife. 
plastic is rolled and then wrapped around the can and a rubber band eventually secures it. The can is then slid out and the cone slid in. The can can be used to push the cone all the way to the bottom if necessary and the rubber band provides a flexible seal. The can should then be chilled to an ideal temperature and the content drunk at your earliest convenience. This isn't strictly part of the build, but it certainly helps me enjoy it. More plastic is cut and wrapped around the silicon tube. This time, the seam is taped lengthwise to hold the plastic in position. Don't overwrap the plastic in tape as it will make removal difficult later on. Thanks to the plaster nozzle on the end of the tube, the tube sits centrally inside the plaster cone, leaving a fairly even gap all around. Notice that I've added more rubber bands here as well, though none of these are strong enough to crush the shape, just strong enough to hold it. Everything is placed onto a small piece of plastic and the sides are squeezed to gently allow more plaster of Paris to be poured. Again, it's a little on the thick side. The sides are tapped to remove any air bubbles and allow everything to settle. An hour later, the rubber bands are removed and the plastic outer shell is removed and washed ready for next time. Poking a finger through the hole at the bottom, it's easy to push out the cone, though the outer plastic shell stays behind. And that's why we didn't use much tape. The shell is plastic and doesn't bond well, but the tape would glue itself in place. Gripping the inner top corner of the plastic, it's turned as if to rotate it, and sure enough the plastic core pulls free, ready for cleaning and using another time. What's left is a plaster cylinder with a funnel shaped bottom. It's best to give this a couple of days in a warm spot to dry out properly. And here is one that's been tidied up with a little sandpaper. So that's the feeders and vents finished, but there is one more thing. Our resident casting guru, Martin the Old Foundryman, has informed me that plaster retains water. Now he's a clever bloke, a true professional, and he really knows his stuff. He quoted chemical formulas at me until I went all glassy-eyed and started to dribble. But the crux of the matter is these plaster feeders and vents of mine should be baked in an oven and slowly heated until they reach 400 degrees C. Now I do bake mine to 200, but I don't go all the way to 400. Sorry Martin, it's simply because I use green sand when casting, and for me there's more water in the sand than there can possibly be in the plaster, so I really can't see the point. But I could be wrong, so I give you Martin's sage advice and it's up to you whether or not you follow it. Now this process may seem a little cumbersome, but these plaster vents and feeders are a wonderful aid to metal casting, and with all the equipment now made and ready, they can quickly be produced time and time again. Try it and you'll be surprised the difference it can make to your metal casting. Whee! And I think we can call that a finished video. I hope you enjoyed this one guys and if you did please like it. If you've got any questions on this subject please drop me a line. Don't forget to check out my website and please subscribe if you haven't already done so. Look out for my other videos on my YouTube channel and send in any comments and video requests. So that's it for now guys, thanks for watching.